This is Steve Robbins. Welcome to the Get It Done Guys Quick and Dirty Tips to Work Less and Do More. This is the second part of my interview with radical candor author Kim Scott. If you recall, last week we left off talking about what to do when you disagree with feedback that you receive. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conversation, and if you don't, just send along a little feedback, and I'm sure I'll agree. You really have to be willing to listen, keep your mouth shut, because I can easily imagine getting defensive yeah. if someone were telling me something that I didn't like. And and then this business about if you don't agree, wait a day, I would be spending that entire day going over their evil, obnoxious criticism in my mind, <laughs> explaining all the reasons why they're wrong and I'm right. And presumably at some point I have to get past that, yeah. <laughs> is what you're saying. Yeah. And I actually have to say, here's the pieces I agree with. And yeah. you know, let me explain the pieces I don't. Do I, I do, What if they're adamant? Do I have to... Do I eventually assume that maybe they are right and this is a blind spot of mine? Or at some point, do we agree to disagree or I think, do I fire them? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, if, 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 if it's hard to fire your peers. So, so I, I think that at a certain point, you, there, was a, there was a really good phrase at, uh, I believe it was at Intel, listen, challenge, commit. At some point, you do have to commit to a course of action. And and hopefully you've built the kind of relationships at work where some of the time it's going to be your way and other others of the time it'll be another person's way when when you have a disagreement. I mean you can't argue endlessly because then work just becomes or life becomes impossible. So, but you do have to take the time to listen to each other, to challenge each other, and then to just decide what you're going to do. Okay, and if you are going to do the whole agree to disagree thing. At least it's on the table and you know that you've had the conversation and if you needed to later, you could reopen it and say, hey, exactly. maybe that thing I disagreed with, maybe I'm wrong or ha ha, I'm right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not quite ha ha, I'm right. But, but it, you know, it, it's funny. I used to, I one time had a big argument with somebody at work, a peer of mine, and, and in the end, I did not listen to, to her feedback. And it emerged uh, about six months later that she was totally right and I was totally wrong. And I brought her this big, I was, I was wrong, you were right statue. So when you are wrong, sort of celebrate it. I mean, that gets back to your point about vulnerability. You, the, the whole point of candor is just that we're all trying to get to the best answer together. And none of us is always right. And and being able to openly admit that and to show that it's valuable to learn when you're wrong is just makes work and life more fun, makes relationships more fun. Which brings me to the next question, uh, which maybe this is obvious, but I'm going to suggest that maybe it isn't. I love the idea of being truthful and radical candor and showing vulnerability, and I look around and I say, there are some very, very prominent and famous people who, who, and very successful, at least in the outer forms of success, who absolutely and categorically do not exhibit these traits. And <laughs> that is true. I, I'm thinking we, we may have even elected one <laughs> recently. Um, well, now, remember, use the radical candor framework to guide conversations, not to judge yourself or other people. But but we, I would say... In general, the nature of our political discourse uh, is is veers between obnoxious aggression, manipulative insincerity, and and some ruinous empathy too. You know, there's a phrase that says politics divides, and I think we often are not having political conversations or arguments because we don't want to upset each other. But as a result. All these little arguments haven't happened, and now we have this big cataclysmic argument. Sure. So why? So so the the actual question I wanted to get to there is why radical candor? Why is this superior from? Let's say you are the boss. Can't you just tell people to like you know be quiet and do their jobs? It seems much more efficient and quicker and not as pleasant. I mean, absolutely. But why is radical candor important versus more traditional command and control? You know, I don't really care what people feel. They just have to do what I say because I control their paycheck. Right. So my strong belief is that telling people what to do doesn't work. I think that power and control work really well in a baboon troop or a totalitarian regime. 
But those kinds of organizations have not proven to achieve the greatest results, and they're certainly terrible places to to live in and to work. We can do much better than that. I believe that to unleash human potential, we need to be radically candid with each other, not to be obnoxious and aggressive with each other, and also not to be so worried about short-term feelings that we're we're not pointing out mistakes to each other when when it's it's really an act of generosity to do so. So I think in order to achieve great results, you need radical candor. So one of the things that was striking about your book, right? You you went to to HBS, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so did I. So I'm reading this book and I'm thinking, wow, we both went to the same place. And then we both went to Silicon Valley and, you know, we both joined famous startups and I made enough money to pay off a third of my student loans. And you're hanging out with the founders of Google and Sheryl Sandberg and so on and so forth. And, oh, my God, I'm such a total and complete failure in comparison to you. No, um, come on. <laughs> so um, uh, as I was going through all of this, I I was thinking, I was thinking, wow, um, you know, this is great. but but i to the to the limited extent that that i am personally familiar with silicon valley ceos um i certainly dealt with one once who when he heard negative feedback about something that was going on and i don't even mean his own behavior i mean if someone told mm-hmm. him that there was that the numbers didn't add up on a project that he wanted to do he literally would yell and scream and jump up and down and shake his fists mhm and you know we we the people who he did this around didn't quit but one of the questions that I found myself struggling with is, let's say I'm really committed to the idea of radical candor, both with my teammates, also with the people who work for me, if there are any, and also with my bosses. Because, you know, frankly, I don't want to see my boss's pet project fail. I know right. that my boss really wants to do this. What if my boss is hasn't read your book or has read it and really isn't personally bought into the idea of radical candor, but I am? How do I deal with this boss who's yelling, who's jumping up and down yelling and screaming when I have an unpleasant truth, but boy, it's really important for the company and even for my boss. He may not like hearing it, but you know, once he calms down, he'll realize that he would rather have known than not known. How do I deal with that? Because I think yeah, a lot of people are... Such an important question. And, and I also have had bosses like that. I had a boss who was so belittling to me that I literally, I shrank half an inch and I'm barely five feet tall. I don't have a, an inch to give while I was working for him. I happily gained it back when I quit. Uh, so, so that's the part of the, part of the answer is don't forget to quit if, if the person is really terrible, but that's not always an option. So I think there, the, 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 the interesting thing about this belittling boss that I had was that I bumped into him about 10 years later and we had a drink and I realized as we were halfway through our glass of wine that he wasn't nearly as bad as as I had made him out to be. I realized the reason why I was so angry and so upset by by his behavior that I literally shrank. And I've seen this happen. People get hives from bad bosses. They they get insomnia. I mean, it's really terrible. Uh, but I realized, for me at least, in this situation, the problem was not his behavior. The problem was my reaction to his behavior. I didn't stand up to him. When he was really rude to colleagues of mine, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say anything. I would just, I would just sort of duck my head and, and try to get through the day. And I realized that I was, the problem was that I felt weak and I felt ashamed of my own reaction or non-reaction to this kind of bad behavior. So often when we are confronted with obnoxious aggression, we retreat to manipulative insincerity. We don't, we don't meet it with radical candor. And, and I think that is why these terrible bosses continue to get away with, they think they're getting away with it because nobody is challenging them on the way that they're behaving. So, but you, you want to do it carefully. I one time gave a radical candor talk and somebody tweeted at me later, tried radical candor on my boss, got fired. (laughs) I felt terrible. I said, how can I help? 
But the person said, actually, I'm better off. I already, I already have another job. So I think that the thing to do when you're confronted with a boss whose behavior you find really depleting in some way is first to start by soliciting feedback, the stuff we already talked about. Come up with your go-to question. You want to understand where that person's head is. Um, you, you, wanna, you want to make them tell you how they're feeling, and you want to not react defensively at first. And then spend a little bit of time focusing on the good stuff. Usually, you've chosen this job for a reason. There's some things that you do like. And to give voice to the the positive stuff, feedback is both praise and criticism. And it's important to remember the good things. I once had a friend who was working for a boss like the one you described, a terrible boss. And... Uh, and he had a reputation as just being impossibly brutal to work for. And she she adopted a mantra. She decided she was only going to talk to him about the things that bothered her that he was doing. And with everyone else, she, she whenever they asked about him, her mantra was, there is only love. She wasn't going to talk badly about him behind his back, but she was going to raise the stuff to his face. So she told him the good things, but then she also, having solicited the feedback and having told him the things that she appreciated about working for him, she did tell him the things that were really not okay. And you know what? She actually had a decent experience working for the guy. Wow, excellent. Um, I am but looking at the that d- won't always happen, by the way. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Uh, oh, yeah. It is one of my flaws. Sometimes you just have to quit. Don't forget to quit. <laughs> Don't forget to quit if things get too bad and you just end up having someone who is impenetrable. Yeah. If you're working, if you are working for a real Kandorian demon, um, yeah. there are limits to what can be achieved. Yes. Escape from the dementors of this world, and there are some. Now, our time, unfortunately, is just about up. I'm wondering, what are you doing now, and how can people who you would like to find you find you? We have decided that the best way to help people adopt the idea of Radical Candor is to launch a podcast called Radical Candor and also to launch an app called The Candor Coach. And the podcast will give you 20 minutes of, of great sort of Q&A. We, we get a lot of listener dilemmas. It's sort of like a, a one-on-one every week about uh, about how to succeed at work, how not to hate the boss you have or be the boss you hate. And uh, and, the, and the app just gives you a quick nugget every day. Here's the one conversation you should have. Here's who you should have it with. And here's some tips on how to have the conversation. Two-minute mm. quick impromptu conversations. And where can people find these? Uh, on the App Store. So right now, unfortunately, it's only um, it's only an iPhone app. We are working on the Android app, and iTunes, Stitcher, uh, any place you listen to podcasts, just search for Radical Candor. Fantastic. And of course, you can buy the book. You got to oh, buy the book. Yes, of course. <laughs> uh, and in fact, we are going to at the end of this uh, at the end of this interview or the, and the end of the episode, uh, we're going to have a bonus clip from the audiobook, which is narrated by. You. Me and my squeaky voice. Exactly. Um, I'm sorry. I didn't mean. That. You know, I I listen to I listen to podcasts usually on double speed. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, so all I never, voices are squeaky. Right, and I never know what someone really sounds like. And I guess when you meet famous people who you've seen in movies, the thing you always say is, "Oh, you're so much shorter in person." Right. And. <laughs> <laughs> when I've listened to someone's audiobook, it's always like, wow, you have such a deeper voice in person. <laughs> that is great. Well, thank you very much for joining us. And everyone, you should go out and get a copy of the book, Radical Candor, download the app, The Candor Coach, and check out the podcast, Radical Candor. Thank you very much, Kim. Thank you. Real pleasure. Keep listening after my regular sign-off for a free audiobook segment from Kim's book, Radical Candor. I'm Steve Robbins. Follow Get It Done Guy on Twitter and Facebook. I run programs to help you develop the skills you need to create an extraordinary life. If you want to know more, visit steverobbins.com or join my personal mailing list by texting Get It Done to 33444. And now keep listening for a free segment of Radical Candor. Work less, do more, and have a great life. Hey. 
How to be a good boss. Given my line of work, I get asked by almost everyone I meet how to be a better boss slash manager slash leader. For years, I got questions from people who worked for me, the CEOs I coached, the people who attended a class I taught or a talk I gave. Now I get questions from people who are using the Feedback Gauge or other management apps that Russ and I co-founded a company, Candor Inc., to build. Others have submitted their management dilemmas to Radical Candor's website, RadicalCandor.com. But questions also come from the harried parent sitting next to me at the school play who doesn't know how to tell the babysitter not to feed the kids so much sugar the contractor who is frustrated when his crew doesn't show up on time, the nurse who's just been promoted to supervisor and is telling me how bewildering it is. As she takes my blood pressure, I feel I should be taking hers. The business executive who's speaking with exaggerated patience into his cell phone as we board a plane turns it off and asks nobody in particular, why did I hire that goddamn moron? The friend, still haunted by the expression on the face of an employee whom she laid off years ago. Regardless of who asked the questions, they tend to reveal an underlying anxiety. Many people feel they aren't as good at management as they are at the, quote, real, unquote, part of the job. Often, they fear they are failing the people who report to them. While I hate to see this kind of stress— I find these conversations productive because I know I can help. By the end of these talks, people feel much more confident that they can be a great boss. There's often a funny preamble to the questions I get because most people don't like the words for their role. Boss evokes injustice. Manager sounds bureaucratic. Leader sounds self-aggrandizing. I prefer the word boss because the distinctions between leadership and management tend to define leaders as BSers who don't actually do anything and managers as petty executors. Also, there's a problematic hierarchical difference implied in the two words, as if leaders no longer have to manage when they achieve a certain level of success and brand new managers don't have to lead. Richard Tedlow's biography of Andy Grove, Intel's legendary CEO, asserts that management and leadership are like forehand and backhand. You have to be good at both to win. I hope by the end of this book, you'll have a more positive association with all three words, boss, manager, leader. Having dispensed with semantics, the next question is often very basic. What do bosses slash managers slash leaders do? Go to meetings? Send emails, tell people what to do, dream up strategies and expect other people to execute them? It's tempting to suspect them of doing a whole lot of nothing. Ultimately, though, bosses are responsible for results. They achieve these results not by doing all the work themselves, but by guiding the people on their teams. Bosses guide a team to achieve results. The questions I get asked next are clustered around each of these three areas of responsibility that emerge from what managers do, guidance, team building, and results. First, guidance. Guidance is often called feedback. People dread feedback, both the praise, which can feel patronizing, and especially the criticism. What if the person gets defensive, starts to yell, threatens to sue, bursts into tears? What if the person refuses to understand the criticism or can't figure out what to do to fix the problem? What if there isn't any simple way to fix the problem? What should a boss say then? But it's no better when the problem is really simple and obvious. Why doesn't the person already know it's a problem? Do I actually have to say it? Am I too nice? Am I too mean? Second, team building. Building a cohesive team means figuring out the right people for the right roles, hiring, firing, promoting. But once you've got the right people and the right jobs, how do you keep them motivated? Particularly in Silicon Valley, the questions sound like this. Why does everyone always want the next job when they haven't even mastered the job they have yet? Why do millennials expect their career to come with instructions like a Lego set? Why do people leave the team as soon as they get up to speed? Why do the wheels keep coming off the bus? 
Why won't everyone just do their job and let me do mine? Third, results. Many managers are perpetually frustrated that it seems harder than it should be to get things done. We just doubled the size of the team, but the results are not twice as good. In fact, they are worse. What happened? Sometimes things move too slowly. The people who work for me would debate forever if I let them. Why can't they make a decision? But other times, things move too fast. We missed our deadline because the team was totally unwilling to do a little planning. They insisted on just firing willy-nilly, no ready, no aim. Why can't they think before they act? Or they seem to be on automatic pilot. My team is doing exactly the same thing this quarter that they did last quarter, and they failed last quarter. Why do they expect the results to be different? Guidance, team, and results. These are the responsibilities of any boss. This is equally true for anyone who manages people, CEOs, middle managers, and first-time leaders. CEOs may have broader, more complex problems to deal with, but they still have to work with other human beings with all the quirks and skills and weaknesses just as apparent and relevant to their success in the C-suite as when they got their very first management role. It's natural that managers who wonder whether they are doing right by the people who report directly to them want to ask me about these three topics. I'll address each fully over the course of this book.